Hi, welcome to Orthopod. I'm here with Professor Emil Shemich, Chair of the Department of Surgery at Western University in Canada. Uh, Emil Shemich has been um, really carefully uh, monitoring and watching as Canada reopens uh, it, its surgical uh, procedures, more so than they have in the past. And I think um, the question I have for you, Dr. Shemich, is you know, what are the major issues um, that are that you're currently facing as a leader thinking about managing not only orthopedics, um, but the Department of Surgery as a whole? Well, thanks, Mo. Thanks for having me um, on this afternoon. Um, I mean, there's no question um, you've asked sort of the critical question. Um, we've certainly seen um, a dramatic change in terms of the way surgical care is uh, delivered across uh, both the province and uh, the country. Uh, with the ramp down um, in uh, surgery, uh, there's been um, a massive backlog of surgical cases that need to be um, looked after. Um, surgeons in general are, are keen to get back to operating, to looking after their um, patients, and we're trying to um, balance um, doing that in a safe, um, cautious way uh, with um, understanding the fact that um, there are many patients that need to be um, looked after. Uh, one of the concerns, um, you know, from my point of view, is um, the fact that um, there's much in the way of uh, urgent, time-sensitive surgical care that's been um, deferred and um, and uh, delayed. So, if you look specifically at, you know, cancer surgery, cardiac surgery, um, transplant, uh, neurosurgery, and other time-sensitive surgery. Um, although um, a volume of that type of surgery um, has been uh, performed over the last eight weeks, um, it's much reduced um, compared to before this um, uh, pandemic uh, uh, occurred. So there's no question that because that surgery is so time sensitive and uh, you know patients will come to um, serious harm, um, that surgery really needs to be um, uh, prioritized. The problem with um, all of that is, is that um, you then have many patients who need um, non-urgent surgery, such as orthopedic surgery, specifically things like hip, hip and knee replacements, that um, really um, um, is uh, prioritized and not to be done uh, um, in advance of things like cancer, cardiac surgery, transplant surgery, um, and so forth. So, um, you know, across the province of Ontario, we've literally had tens of thousands of uh, surgical cancellations. And really there's a need to get um, um, that volume of work um, done. The problem is, is that um, before this all started, our system was already sort of straining at the seams. And there's not really a lot of capacity um, in the system to um, allow us to do more work that will allow us to uh, quote unquote um, catch up. So even if you know we introduce new models of care um, that will allow us to look after more patients, um, I still see us really having um, a significant challenge um, in terms of actually um, being able to uh, catch up in terms of musculoskeletal uh, care um, across the province of Ontario and also across the country. So. Dr. Shamash, in this situation, I, I, like I, I see that there's two big issues. One is within within orthopedics, there's the backlog, right? There's the issue of okay, how are we actually going to manage this backlog, and how are you going to prioritize within orthopedics? You know, this precious phased reopening. How do you prioritize? Who gets that time within orthopedics? And then within the broader spectrum of surgical time, how does orthopedics fare against uh, other areas, and how do we? How does one decide which one matters more? And I know we use uh, often sort of the the, the more um, perceived objective ones, and clearly they are mortality, alive or dead, which is a very important one. But there's also states, as we know, in health utility, where you can have states of living that are in fact perceived worse than death, and that often happens when you have major chronic illness. How does that all get fared in? Are, are there like is there an independent committee, or like how how are you actually operationalizing? how this time will be used, or what are models that people are talking about? Well, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, I, I think in the past, we've um, not really had to really face this kind of um, an issue to the degree that we're facing it now. Um, I think there's a uh, you know, much increased um, um, uh, need for ethical frameworks. And so um, I think those ethical frameworks are, are being um, developed with the help of you know, ethicists and 
individuals who have um, expertise um, in this area. Uh, the problem though is um, at the end of the day, a framework is just a framework and you still need to have some um, adjudication. I think, you know, hospitals are moving uh, towards um, uh, centralized committees with representation that is broad. So, you know, surgery, anesthesia, administration, um, and aesthetist, um, um, uh, nursing, um, and so forth to help, um, you know, do some of these um, adjudications. Um, I don't think the process will be um, perfect, um, but it's something that's going to need to be in place for that um, to occur uh, more effectively than it's occurred in the past. So when you look at time horizons, when do you think that we're ever going to get back to what would be considered pre-COVID level of access to surgery? Or, or is the new normal going to be, well, maybe the best we're going to get back to is 90% of what we used to do, and that's just going to be the way it is? Or presumably you have to have more. Well, I would agree with you. To certainly, if you're going to do backlog modeling, you're going to have to, um, you know, get to a level where you're at least at a steady state, and then get to a point beyond which um, to then catch up uh, in yeah, terms yeah. of a massive backlog of cases. One of the the problems right now is the fear that if you get to um, to a high degree of occupancy, um, the hospital's too crowded, um, and then you're going to be in a situation where you actually um, are going to, um, you know, have um, again increased risk because of crowding yeah. um, and and uh, so forth. So, if you kind of look at the way things were before this pandemic. Um, we would often have situations where hospital occupancy was at the 105 percent um, level. I think most people now would say that um, that is totally not appropriate and and so um, you know you're kind of looking at situations where maybe you know 85 or 90 percent occupancy is more um, in the range of acceptability. So question then becomes is um, you know can you um, uh, create new models of care um, where you can um, uh, potentially, uh, you know, utilize the um, entire week um, to make the hospital like a seven-day, 24-hour-a-day hospital, mm -hmm. so that rather than having, you know, a peak of activity from Monday to Friday, eight to four, um, you have smooth activity over seven days, and you're maybe operating um, later in the day or operating in two shifts um, in the day, potentially operating on uh, Saturday and Sunday. And so overall increasing the level of activity, but never um, quite getting to the state where you were at, um, you know, 105% uh, occupancy. I think also, um, you know, in terms of what needs to be done, I mean, a hospital, I mean, hospitals um, tend to be, you know, procedural platforms. And so you do surgery in hospitals, um, you don't necessarily need to have face-to-face -face, um, clinic visits. So. Um, you know, a large part of what it is that you um, might do in terms of new models of care would be to focus on uh, means so that there's less patients, um, you know, in clinics, um, less clinic visits, trying to do uh, many of the visits uh, virtually, um, you know, having um, uh, situations where um, flow through the clinic is improved. So rather than um, having multiple patients sitting in your waiting room, potentially having them out um, in, in their car with an app or something that notifies them when it's their, their turn to come into the clinic um, and so forth. So I think there's a, um, a lot of work that can really be done in terms of optimizing um, patient flow through um, clinics. Uh, the other thing too is, is optimizing our use of um, you know, ambulatory care. So trying to focus on um, you know, um, potentially the use of uh, surgery centers um, and ambulatory hospitals to try and get as much of the work as done um, uh, as an outpatient as is possible. And I would imagine that even with all those efficiencies, that you're also dealing with the other issue, which is um, just the actual efficiency of a typical OR day. So uh, you would imagine that even in, under the new reopening, there would be a different amount of cases getting through. But how many cases, what would be the reduction in efficiency of a surgeon's operative practice, you think, based on this? Is it going to go down to 50% efficiency in a typical day, given the delays that are associated with, you know, distancing of patients and also making sure that there's, you know, appropriate cleanup and, uh, you know, uh, processes and are in place for the ORs? How long is that going to add to the delay? We've lost about 25 to 30% efficiency now. So, okay. Okay. so if we're doing, um, you know, for example, um, 
four joint replacements in a day, eight to four. I probably yeah. look three now, okay. um, uh, as opposed to the four that I was doing before. So okay. I mean, that's going to have a um, a large impact as well. And that's presuming that you know all else is well um, on every other front. So right, right, right. There's you know all the PPE that you would need, the drugs, right. the, right. the ice beds, uh, beds um, regular beds, uh, equipment and supplies um, that you know you're. Um, COVID situation is uh, stable and not increasing, um, that there's no issues with nursing homes, that patients are able to leave hospital um, safely with a place to go um, and so forth. There seem to be a lot more unanswered questions than there are answers, but I guess it seems to me that you're working hard as with many of the other leaders in, uh, you know, in, in the various institutions trying to figure this out. And uh, we'll hope to have you back soon. Dr. Shamish, to kind of hear, hear, hear um, if you've gotten protocols in place and we can get those messages that I think the biggest thing right now is share information as quick as we can. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you so much.